Praise the Lord. And that is great. Thank you so much. Boy, I love that. I love it. I love it. Take out your Bibles, please. We're going to be in a couple places this morning. Uh, but we're going to start off in 1 Samuel 23. 1 Samuel 23. And then I'm going to ask, if you would, to turn with me to Psalm 54. Psalm 54. I find it interesting how God puts things together, even with the preacher mentioning um, um, missionary to Belize, uh, Brother Harper mentioning things about David, and then uh, the song that, that Sister Judy just sang. Nothing happens by accident. Amen. First Samuel, we're in First Samuel chapter 23, and I'm going to ask if you would please to stand with me uh, for the reading of the Word of God today. 1 Samuel 23 and, oh yes, uh, we need to dismiss our children, that is 6th grade and under. You can go on with Brother Kyle out that away, and uh, they're going to be going to Children's Church today. All right, so good to see all these young'uns here. Amen. And I think there's five or, five or more in the nursery this morning. And uh, so praise God for that. Hallelujah. So we're going to be in 1 Samuel 23 as well as Psalm 54. Make sure you have both of those figured out. All right, there we go. 1 Samuel 23, and we'll begin reading in verse number 14. And David abode in the wilderness in strongholds and remained in a mountain in the wilderness of Ziph. And Saul sought him every day. But God delivered him not into his hand. And David saw that Solomon was come out to seek his life. And David was in the wilderness of Ziph in a wood. Let's skip down now to verse number 19. And they came up to the, then came up the Ziphites to Saul to Gibeah saying, Doth not David hide himself with us in strongholds in the wood? In the hill of Hakala, which is on the south of Jeshimon. Now therefore, O king, come down according to all the desire of thy soul to come down. And our part shall be to deliver him into the king's hand. And Saul said, Blessed be ye of the Lord, for ye have compassion on me. Go, I pray you, prepare yet, and know and see his place where his haunt is, and who shall see him there? For it is told me that he dealeth very subtly. See therefore and take knowledge of all the lurking places where he hideth himself, and come ye again to me with a certainty, and I will go with you. And it shall come to pass, if he be in the land, that I will search him out throughout all the thousands of Judah." And they arose and went to Ziph before Saul. But David and his men were in the wilderness of Maon in the plain on the south of Jeshimon. Saul also and his men went to seek him and they told David, Wherefore he came down into a rock and abode in the wilderness of Maon. And when Saul heard that, he pursued after David in the wilderness of Maon. And Saul went on this side of the mountain, and David and his men on that side of the mountain. And David made haste to get away for fear of Saul. For Saul and his men compassed David and his men round about to take them. But there came a messenger unto Saul, saying, Haste thee and come, for the Philistines have invaded the land. Wherefore Saul returned from pursuing after David and went against the Philistines. Therefore they called the name of the place Sema, or Selah Hamalakoth. Now turn with me, if you would, to Psalm 54. Psalm 54. I'd like to remind you that the psalm actually begins before verse number 1. In the heading that is under the number that is actually part of the psalm. And so it actually starts off by saying to the chief musician on Neganoth, Meshil, a psalm of David when the Ziphims came and said to Saul, Doth not David 
hide himself with us. Lord, I pray that you would help us today. I pray that you would bless your word, that you would bless our flock. And God, if there is someone here that does not know you personally or individually or as a savior or as a shepherd, that the Holy Ghost of God would draw them, Lord, to salvation. Lord, I pray, God, too, that you would encourage those that are gathered here today that are going through some struggle somehow. And I pray that they would find their hope in you as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. Fear had gripped David in an intensely hurtful way. David had been faithful to God and his king and yet had been run out of the kingdom as a vagabond, as a criminal, or even as a wild beast. He was driven from the place that he loved. This was the one that had destroyed Jehovah's enemies. This is the one that had killed Goliath. This is the one that by his hand, God had wrought a great victory and had delivered Israel out of the hand of the Philistines and out of the hand of their enemies at many different times. But now he was running for his life. It's interesting because we read this in 1 Samuel 23 just a few moments ago how that the place there in the wilderness of Ziph, it was in the place of Hakalah. And can I tell you today I'd like to speak for a few minutes on help in the haunts of Hakalah. That word Hakalah, it means dark and it means dusky. And can I tell you, there's going to be times in your life where you're going to enter into some places that are going to be rather dark. But David even had an answer for that. In Psalm 27, David said, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? And friend, when you're going in those dark places, don't you know that you need some light going on around you? I'd like to remind you of John 8, 12, then spake Jesus again to them saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And it sure is good to know that when you come to the dark places, when you come to the devilish places, when you come to the demonic places or the discouraging places or the depressing places or the distressing places, it sure is good to know that there's a light that can guide you through those dark places. Here, though, we need to understand a couple things that it's possible for us to look at this and say, my goodness, this was horrible because of what Saul was was trying to do to David. But friend, that's only a small part of the story. I'd like to remind you the bigger thing for us to look at is what God was working in the life of David. Can I tell you this? God had to teach David some things. He had to teach some things about restraint before he could allow him to reign. And in your life today, you might be struggling and you might be saying, oh, but I'm, I'm being hounded by things in my past and I'm, I've got a struggle and it seems like it's a struggle to life and, and my enemy is after me and they're ready to consume me and they want to hurt me. But friend, let me remind you, it's not always about your enemy. Your life is about God and what God is doing in your life. You need to learn, and I mean I'm included in that, but we all need to learn how to rest on the Lord because I believe that every person needs to get out of the haunts in their life and into the home of God's help that God has prepared for you in the midst of this thing. 
I don't know if there's anyone around here that has ever heard this terminology, but I remember my, I had a, a lot of uh, family uh, that were hillbillies in Kentucky, uh, and uh, that's what they were. They were just hillbilly. And by the way, if you don't know what the difference is, there's a great difference between rednecks and hicks and hillbillies. I'll just tell you that. You can figure it out on your own, all right? But my family, they were hillbillies there in Kentucky, and uh, he was always talking about haints. Anybody ever heard about haints, heard those terms? All right, good, good. The old school does remember those things. And they were talking whether they were demons or whatever, but they'd call them haints. And they were haunts uh, that they just, uh, you know, would pronounce as haint. And, uh, but sure enough, whatever, whatever issue, and I'm not here talking about demons this morning, don't misunderstand me, but there are going to be times in your life where you're going to go through some haunting places. You're going to have to endure some haunting things. You ever go through some, and I've heard numerous people that have said this, Pastor, it was a nightmare. Have you ever heard that term? And can I tell you, whatever issue it is that you're going through, you need to quit worrying and running from what you perceive to be your enemy and you need to allow God to fulfill His work in your life. In the New Testament, it would say things like this. Uh, uh, the, um, Paul uh, said, Therefore I take pleasure in infirmity, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. The Bible also says that patience uh, um, uh, cometh um, uh, by tribulation. And friend, let me tell you, God is the great mastermind. It's not the devil that is in charge. Can I get an amen? The devil's not the one in charge. The devil is not the one that is ruling or overruling whatever it is that he does. God has allowed that to come into your life and you need to know that God can overrule that at any point he desires to. So you might be scratching your head and you might be saying, well, why is God gonna have me go through that? And I've got one word for you or one thought for you and that is this, who can can say anything to the potter. God knows the work that he's trying to fulfill in your life. Your issue is trust. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding and all thy ways. Acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path. But we do see three different attitudes that David had here that show his progression and how he was dealing with with the hauntings of his life. As a matter of fact, I find it interesting that Saul was the one that labeled it a haunt. As a matter of fact, he not only labeled it a haunt, he said, you find those lurking places where David lives. And by the way, Christian, you need to understand this. Uh, not everywhere you live is always the nicest place. I'm not talking about your home. I'm just talking about your place that uh, uh, in your life where you're at right now in your spiritual life, you might think, my goodness, this is a mess. My goodness, this is a haunt. My goodness, all it does, it breathes down my neck. All it does, it taunts me. All it does is hurt me. But friend, you need to understand that God can do a work in your life to help you see it as a blessing. I'd like to remind you of Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are the called according to his purpose. But let's look again here in these verses in Psalm 54 and see where we're at today. And by the way, as the preacher was mentioning earlier, you're going to find Dave, uh, David um, uh, talking with God about a great many topics throughout these psalms. You're going to find him where he is running for his life. He's fleeing over here. He's fleeing in a cave. He's over here in the wilderness of Judah. He's over here in this passage in the wilderness of Ziph. He's running for his life. But yet God is the one that had it all planned out for him 
and was going to use it for his glory. Let's read this, Psalm 54 and verse number 1. The Bible says, Save me, O God, by thy name, and judge me by thy strength. Hear my prayer, O God. Give ear to the words of my mouth, for strangers are risen up against me, and oppressors seek after my soul. They have not set God before them. I'd like to give you these thoughts here this morning. The first thing I'd like to point out, to you is a charge that David gave a charge about his persecutions as a matter of fact there in verse number one he came out and he said oh God save me oh God oh God help me oh God oh God deliver me oh God oh God oh God oh God and he was throwing his hands up saying God I need help by the way do you realize that he was in a bad place as a matter of fact, he was being, uh, he's talking about how he's being treated even by his own friends. Would you look at your Bibles? It might even be on the same page. But look at chapter 55 of the book of Psalms. Psalm 55. And look, if you would, at verse number 13. The Bible says, But it was thou, a man, mine equal, my guide, mine acquaintance. We took sweet counsel together and walked under the house of God in company. Let death seize upon them. Let them go quickly, uh, uh, go down quick into hell. For wickedness is in their dwellings and among them. As for me, I will call upon God and the Lord shall save me. Evening and morning and at night noon will I pray and cry aloud and he shall hear my voice I've got a question have you ever been mistreated by somebody if you're over the age of 12 you can say yes we've all been mistreated by somebody amen but you need to know a couple things about this <laughs> this right here in David's part of his life he had been challenged by Goliath and defeated him he had been challenged by a bear and defeated him he had been challenged by a lion and defeated him he had been challenged by his own brother and defeated him here he's being challenged and chased by his own king and it ought to be the one that loves him most and it ought to be the one that cares about him most it ought to be the one uh, that prays for him and lifts him up before God and instead this is the one that he had been serving with all of his heart and yet he is betrayed by the way the pain of betrayal is very real the pain of betrayal hurts for a long time he was his treatments by his friends and those that were closest to him. He could understand it if it was Goliath that was after him. He could understand it if it was a Philistine army that was after him. But it wasn't that, was it? It was those that he counted dear. It was those that he should have been able to trust. And instead they were scheming behind his back to find a way to destroy him. God never takes kindly to that kind of a mentality. It's wicked in the sight of God. And that's why we have the greatest picture in all scripture in the person and work of Judas Iscariot that with his own kiss, as his beard graced the presence and graced the side of our own Savior's cheek, it dug much further than any nail and any spear could have ever done. How that Jesus said to him, Friend, betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss? Oh, nothing hurts as much as betrayal. No, not only is it treatments by friends, but he was taunted by his former employer. How about this one? He was terrified by his fears. Scared out of his mind. He said, God, save me. God, save me. God, save me. I don't know where to go. I don't know who to turn to. God, save me. Saul it's interesting that his, his fears are coming together in the person and work of Saul. And by the way, isn't it something, uh, this is a twofold thing here. Saul was haunted by David. 
and he never found relief from it. Saul went to his grave being haunted by the things that God had brought about in his life. But he would never submit and he would never surrender and he would never accept what God was doing in his life. And because of that, when God wrought about, you better be listening, when God brought about another king right there, (laughs) and he would not hear and he would not help, it was that king that haunted him until he expired. Matter of fact, he dedicated his whole life to stamping him out. Let's get rid of him. Let's get rid of everything about him. I don't want to remember that name, David. Matter of fact, he hated the fact that his son Jonathan loved David. He hated the fact that Jonathan knew that David would reign. He hated it, and it haunted Saul his whole life. But the hauntings of David would vary. Sometimes they were done in a person. Sometimes they were done in a place. Sometimes they came out in the way of a problem. But I'm telling you that this right here, they were hauntings that he must endure. What do you think haunted David in this thing? How about this? (laughs) Unfulfilled promises. I got a question. Do you not think that David knew he was anointed? Do you not think that David knew that God had given him the kingdom? Do you not think that David knew everything that was going on and he could have said, God, you promised me, but God, you're a liar. Not only are they unfulfilled promises, how about this, unchanged circumstances. God, I do this, and I do this, and I do this, and God, I've tried to change my life, and I've tried to give you this, and I've tried to honor you here, and God, nothing ever changes. I'm still on the run. I'm still on the lamb. I'm still eating off uh, things that I can find on the side of the road. How about this? Unusual people. Is everybody all right this morning? You remember who showed up to help David here? I'm not going to go back through it, but the Bible says there were three people. People that were disappointed, discouraged, and in debt. In other words, he didn't have a real good crowd with him. Somebody help me. Is everybody all right? (laughs) We'll just say they were a little bit different. They were a little bit weird. They were a little bit unusual. You ever been around someone that's unusual? Don't look next, don't look next to you when you say this. You ever, seen, you ever seen someone that's a little bit unusual? Yeah. That was, that was David's whole crowd. Come on now. That was David's whole crowd. Nobody, he's just like, my goodness, God, help me. God, we're just a ragtag bunch. We ain't got nothing going for us. There ain't nobody here can do anything. There ain't nobody here got any money. There ain't nobody here got any expertise. There ain't nobody here that can do this. There ain't nobody here that can do that. He was gathered and he was surrounded by unusual people. How about this? Unyielding conditions. Knowing that you have been anointed by God to be king. Don't you think he'd have said, God, I've had enough of this desert experience. God, have you ever asked this? God, why doesn't it ever let up? God, what's going on? God, what am I doing? God. Why is it so hard? God, what, what am I going to do next week? God, how are you going to help me through this? God, is your word still true? God, do you still love? God, do you still know even who I am? The second thing I'd like you to see, though, is not only the charge that he was giving about his persecutions, But I want you to see a second attitude was this. He had to have a change about his perception. Uh, Look at this now, if you would, verse, uh, verse number four. He says, behold, 
God is mine helper. The Lord is with them that uphold my soul. He shall reward evil unto mine enemies. Cut them off in thy truth. Now I want to back up here and I want to say this again. Let's go back to get the full effect of what's being said here. Let's go back and read verse number three. Okay? Here's what the Bible says. For strangers are risen up against me and oppressors seek after my soul. They have not set God before them. And what's the next word there? Selah. And that sila is an interesting word, but it just means that there was a break uh, in the thought there, and it means that there was a time to meditate. Let me explain how some of this is going. Here's David. He's running for his life, trying to just live from place to place, and here he is on the backside of the desert in the wilderness of Ziph, hiding himself, and not only is Saul after him, but the people of the area have given him up, saying, oh my goodness, to Saul here he is he's right here and they put an X on his back marking that's David and David out of fear he says God save me save me oh God by your name God there's a bunch of bad people over here and they're trying to hurt me does everybody follow what I'm saying here but there's a bunch of bad people. Strangers are risen up. People, God, I haven't even hurt. People I have not uh, talked about. People I have not had any dealings with. And yet they're trying to take me out. That's what he's saying here. But now look at verse number four again. There was that break. And it's almost like David said, David was like, God help me, God help me. Look at what they're doing, look at what they're doing. And then there was a sila. David said, all right, get it together. And let's start over. And now I want you to hear what he was saying in verse number four. Behold, God's my helper. Whew, this ought to help somebody today. God's my helper. Like God, you see, here's the problem. You're looking at your situation through the eyes of your enemies. And you ought to be looking at your situation through the eyes of God. He said, God, oh God, save me. God, wicked people are trying to hurt me. God, I don't know how this is going. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. God, you're my helper. Have you ever had to do that? God, you're my helper. God, I know there ain't nobody that's ever taken care of me like you have. God, I don't know how this thing's gonna end up, but God, if I'm going, bless God, I'm going with you. By the way, I wanna point out a couple things to you about this. The word helper, it means to surround, to surround. I'll never forget one time we went on a mission trip out to, uh, uh, we, we were in uh, Ireland, and uh, had the weirdest thing. We were doing a, something for children, and uh, we had a bunch of kids that we had, and we had uh, vanned them in and brought them all in and all this kind of stuff. Well, the people in the area found out that these were the kids of people from another area. And the kids from this area came to whoop up on those. Let me tell you, let me tell you, that ain't good no matter where you're from. I don't care what side of the pond you're from. But it's different when you're in a different, different country. I'm just going to tell you, it's just different. But that, man, man, them Irish people, buddy, it don't take much to get. How many of you got Irish blood in you? Raise your, uh-huh. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about then. All right, you got a little bit of that. Boy, it don't take much to get it on, does it? And sure enough, um, my, we, we, walked, we all walked out there and uh, all of our, our whole group. And you want to know what we did? We compassed those kids all around. When it was time to go, we made a big, huge circle around them. And we walked them. The, the people behind us were coming up. I'm talking about, I mean, swinging swing doing everything they can to get to them kids inside that that little hole and that little ball that we had created and man I mean it's just knock down drag out and we got somebody I mean these kids are flying in jumping in trying to get to them we're taking them and throwing them out it was exciting let me tell you something though it's a different ball game when God surrounds you <laughs> 
Whoo, take your Bible. I want to show this to you real quick. Take your Bibles and turn with me quickly uh, to the book of 2 Kings. 2 Kings. Second Kings chapter 6, turn to it quickly. Second Kings chapter 6, we see this happen one time. And boy, Elisha is out there. And uh, boy, the, the enemy has gathered around him. And uh, the enemy is trying, is threatening and all that kind of stuff. And if you remember the story about Gehazi, he came out there in the morning. And uh, now it doesn't say this in there, but Elisha was out there and had a cup of coffee in his hand. And he's looking, he, and uh, sure enough, uh, he comes out and he says, Oh, master, Gehazi came out. Oh, master, look at all these people. What shall we do? And Elisha just kept sipping on that coffee. He said, ah, not that big a deal. Look at, if you would, 2 Kings 6 and verse 16. And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more. <laughs> are more than they that be with them. And as he began to look around, what did he see? He saw that there was a heavenly host that was gathered all around that place. That God had showed up. Friend, let me tell you something. God's got his host around you. Oh, I'm not saying that you're not gonna go through battles, but you need to look at your battles through the eyes of God. Quit looking at your battles through the eyes of your enemy. Quit looking. You better refocus and you better understand that your footing is found in the promise and in the truth of God himself. Praise God. Matter of fact, I just want you to know a couple of things. Here's the, here's the problem. There in verse number four, he said, God is mine helper. Look what else it says. The Lord is with them that what? Uphold. So we see that he was surrounded, but now he's being upheld. And who's he being upheld by? He's being upheld by people that are around him. Who's that? the nasty people that he, nobody else wanted. Who, who was the one that was helping him? Who was the one that was steadying him? Who was the one that was strength, strengthening him? It was all those people that were disappointed. It was all the, is everybody all right? It was all them people that were discouraged. It was all them people that were in debt. By the way, quit trying to throw, throw those people away from you that God's brought into your life. And you better learn right now to embrace them because God, God will use them to help you when you're at your lowest point. Mm, that's good. That's good. I'm telling you, friend, boy, what a hope and what a blessing we have in being with God. The word uphold, here's what it means, to lean upon. Let me tell you, somewhere along in your life, you're going to need somebody that you can lean upon. Now, it may be one of these faces that's in here. But if these faces fail you, aren't you glad that you've got somebody that'll never turn his back on you? And aren't you glad for a paraclete, a Holy Ghost that comes along on beside of you and helps you and walks with you through every trial and every struggle that you're going to have to endure? Let's go on here. We'll be done here this morning. Look at verse number six. Not only do we see this first attitude, he gave God a charge about his persecutions. Number two was a change about his perception. Number three, he gave him a challenge about his own praise. Look at this, verse number six. I will freely sacrifice unto thee. I will praise thy name, O Lord, for it is good. For he had delivered me out of all trouble and mine eye has seen his desire upon mine enemies. Woo, praise God for someone that knows how to praise the Lord. And you might be here and you may say, but I don't know the Lord and I'm here to tell you, you can know him before you leave here today. You can know that Jesus Christ is your savior. But let me tell you this, there's a lot of people that call themselves Christians and maybe you have accepted Christ as your savior, but you've forgotten all that God has done for you in your life. And you put him on the back burner 
of your life and you've not given him a place of preeminence. You've not given him the place of honor. You've not given him the first fruits of anything. Let me tell you something. God means what he says in his book. Matter of fact, there again, look at verse number six. He says, I will freely sacrifice. He's talking about praise. Matter of fact, let me tell you what the word freely means. You ready? It means spontaneity. Let me say it like this. In other words, you can worship the Lord at any given time you want to. Amen. Amen. You ever been somewhere and you feel it start down in your toes and it starts working its way up your knees and you just know, oh my goodness, I can feel a praise fit coming on because God's been good to me. Oh, even in the midst of your trouble, by the way, I just want you to know, nothing has changed so far in David's situation except for his attitude. Come on now. Everybody all right? Woo! He said, oh, I can freely give. Oh, there ain't nobody stopping me. They ain't Saul. They ain't nobody in his army. They ain't all them people that living out here near me that turned me into him. They ain't not gonna steal my joy. They're not gonna take my praise. I'm still gonna offer it to the Lord. They're not hindering me. They're not bottling me. They're not trying to put me away. By the way, that's one of the things that they tried to stop with a young man named Bartimaeus the Bible says they kept trying to tell him oh don't call out to him don't call out to him and the Bible says that he just lifted up his voice a little bit more friend let me tell you some said of getting an attitude come on now instead of getting an attitude about your situation or about your church or about your job or about your buddy or about your family or whatever it is friend why don't you start saying hey there ain't nobody gonna take my praise I'll just lift up my voice and I'll praise him anyway. Praise God, man. Ain't nobody stopping you except you. He said here, there's free praise. How about this? There's fresh praise. Look at that, verse number six. What did he call it there? I will freely what? Is everybody getting it? This is something that should be fresh. It ought to be fresh on your heart. Someone said, I I was talking with, it might have even been Kyle one time I was talking with him. You know, there's one one kind of an animal. I mean, there's a lot. What, What I mean by creeping things were not allowed as sacrifices. But animals, beasts were allowed. How about fish? No fish was ever allowed. Why? He'd be dead before he ever made it. Let me tell you something. God desires something fresh. I got a question. Don't you? Aren't we promised something fresh? Give us this day. Woo! Now, if you don't like homemade yeast rolls, you got a problem. You don't like homemade bread. But can I tell you, doesn't it have a better ministry to you when it comes right out of the oven than it does a week later? You realize that God wants something fresh from you. Quit talking about them glory days. What are you doing for God now? Now. Here. Now. I tell you what we eat. Get over yourself. He's here now. Serve him now. Give him glory now. Worship him now. Give to him now. This is your chance. He wants a fresh sacrifice. Not only do we see, <laughs> whew, it was a free praise. It was a fresh praise. By the way, let me say it like this. Hebrews 13, 15. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice. Get this. Offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. How about this? It was a fervent praise. Mm. I love this. See that verse number, the, 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 the last part of verse six. I will freely sacrifice unto thee. I will praise thy name, O Lord, 
for it is what? Well, if I just had something, you've got something. you got his name. What else do you want? How many of you believe that God's name is good? Good, good, good. Matter of fact, I'll tell you this. He, he promises if you use his name uh, blasphemously or in vain that God's going to revisit that to you. Do you love God's name? Why don't you find a way to give him praise for it? Why don't you just get lost in his name? Why don't you just enjoy his name? Why don't you just get fervent about his name? How about this one? <laughs> I love this. Look at verse number seven. For he hath delivered me out of what? Does everybody see this? For he hath delivered me out of what? All trouble. And mine eye hath seen his desire upon mine enemy. And by the way, let, let me say it like this. There's a future praise that you need to get used to. You got a question? Was he in a trouble right here? Oh, he was in a real trouble, wasn't he? We just read about that first Samuel chapter 23. Psalm 54 is where we're, we're reading his response. You know what? There's some things that I can go ahead and praise God for in the future. Amen. Aren't you glad, by the way, that there was a lamb that was slain from the foundations of the world? And aren't you glad that there's a future promise that he's coming back? And aren't you glad that his promise can include you if you accept him to be your own personal savior? Man, boy, I love this. These verses are so full. Matter of fact, you can, can you read that verse? Read verse number seven again there, uh, Brother Allen, if you can. Psalm 54 and verse number seven. Listen carefully. Did you hear that? I'm going to give you one more praise. It was a faith praise. You say, well, I don't know, man. I, I, just, I don't see the Lord doing anything. David did. Before it ever even happened. He'd just been complaining to God. God, you don't ever do anything for me. God, you don't ever help me. God, God, look at what they're doing. And he gathered himself. He said, God, you're my helper. You're my helper. And he began to back up and say some things. Now he's, here he is, and he's saying, you know what, God, I'm going to praise you for what you're going to do. And now he says this, now because I am in a place of faith, I believe, I know, and I can see with the eyes of faith what you are going to do to all of my enemies. Whew. I'm going to tell you, you want to know what's sad to me? is the number of Christians that can't see past their own problem. I'm preaching at me too. I just want you to know that. I'm not talking down to nobody. I'm preaching at me. I just don't know what's going to happen here. By, uh, uh, by the way, let, let me tell you how this thing's going to happen. You ready? I don't know the process. All I know is that he wins. We need to rest. You say, well, how is that possible? Just like Abraham, where the Bible says that he went out looking for a city which hath foundations whose builder and maker is God. Let me remind you something, Christian. We walk by faith, not by sight. Quit looking at your issues. Why don't you look at Christ? If you're still there in Psalm, look at Psalm 94 very quickly and we're done. Let me have our musicians come if we can. Psalm 94. Look at what the Bible says here. Psalm 94 and verse number 18. Here's what it says. When I said, my foot slippeth, thy mercy, O Lord, held me up. Oh, come on now, say amen. Did you hear that? I'm going to read that again. When I said, my foot slippeth. Thy mercy, O Lord, held me up. Okay, wait a minute. I'm not done reading yet. Don't close your Bible. What's mercy? 
Talk to me. What's mercy? We talked about it before. What's grace? God giving you what you do not deserve. <laughs> if you got saved, that's grace. Let me explain this. <laughs> but mercy is God withholding what you do deserve. Let me say it like this. When I get grace and that gift of eternal life, I also get mercy because I deserve, salv I deserve hell and God ain't given that to me. <laughs> but can I tell you this? I deserve, I deserve a whole lot more things than just hell and that, that, that's eternally bad. Let me tell you, there's no reason for God to put his blessing on me. There, I haven't done anything to earn it. Everything that I've done, even the fact that I'm still here is a testimony of his mercy in my life. Boy, I love this verse. Look at it again. <laughs> when I said, my foot slippeth, he said, I knew I was going down, but God, it was your mercy because I deserved to go down. And it was your mercy that held me up because I deserved to go down. Look at the next verse. In the multitude of my thoughts within me, thy comforts delight my soul. Why don't you start filling your heart, your mind, your thoughts with the fullness of God and you'll find out that there will be great blessings that God is waiting to give to you. With every head bowed and every eye closed this morning, nobody looking, I want to ask you a couple questions. If you died right now, I'm not asking if you know about God. I'm not asking if you know that Jesus is God. I'm asking, is He your Savior? I'm not asking if you've ever prayed. I'm asking, have you ever asked Him to be your Savior? Has there ever been a time that you put your faith in? Well, I do that every day. You're not understanding. You're not listening to me. Has there ever been a time that you knew you needed somebody beside you? Somebody better than you. Somebody in place of you to save your soul. And if you might be here this morning, you may say, Pastor, just being honest, I can't say that I am 100% sure that I'm saved. And maybe you'd like to be, but you just want to say, Pastor, that's me. I'm not sure I'm saved. Would you just pray for me? Would you just put your hand up and put it right back down all over the building? God bless you. Thank you. Anybody else? Preacher, pray for me. I'm not sure I'm saved. I'm not sure. How many of you, you're here today and you may say, Pastor, I do know I'm saved, but boy, God spoke to my heart about something. I sure needed something in that word. I needed something in that scripture. If that's you today, would you raise your hand? God bless you. Many hands, many hands, many hands. God bless you. I'm going to ask you right now, would you come? Would you do that? Take care of business with him today. We're going to have an altar call. If God spoke to your heart in any way, would you come? 